Zechariah chapter number 1, verse 12 and 13 will be our scripture text, but we'll be referring to various scriptures in this particular message uh, as we talk about uh, God's special force, angels. This will be the eighth sermon in the series. And this particular message is titled, The Angel of the Lord. Uh, the Angel of the Lord. Uh, look at those two verses of Scripture. Zechariah 1, verse 12 and 13. The Bible says, Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, against which thou hast had indignation these three score and ten years? How many years is that? Seventy years, that's right. And the Lord answered uh, the angel that talked with uh, good words and comfortable words. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And now as we look at it for just a few moments, we ask that you bless it to our hearts and lives as we learn more about your special force, angels. In Jesus' name, amen. Today I want us for just a few moments to look at the many appearances of what is called the angel of the Lord and learn how God uh, revelated uh, himself to mankind in the Old Testament or how he revealed himself to mankind in the Old Testament. Now Michael was a strong angel. Gabriel, or let me just rephrase it, Michael is a strong angel. He's not was, he is, okay? He is a strong angel. Gabriel is a strong angel. In fact, all angels have supernatural strength. But today I want to talk to you about the strongest of all the angels. Whenever we talk about the angel of the Lord. In this particular message, we will basically get a foreshadow of the Lord Jesus Christ's ministry on this earth. His ministry on this earth in the Old Testament times. My friend, there is uh, an angel that materializes uh, from time to time that is just a little bit different uh, than all of the angels that we've looked at thus far. Now the name given to this angel is the angel of the Lord. This angel is more powerful, as I've already said, than Michael. This angel is more knowledgeable in communication than the angel Gabriel. He has characteristics that lets us to, or leads us rather to believe that he is divine. So I want us to look at this angel for just a moment. And we'll be looking at several passages of Scripture that deal with the angel of the Lord. Probably the first appearance that I would like to mention to you is the angel of the Lord and Hagar. Now, if you'll remember, Abraham and Sarah refused to wait on the Lord to fulfill his promise. God had said to Abraham and Sarah if they would just wait right at the right time God would send that chosen son. But you know, as human beings, you and I don't have very much patience. Amen. Amen? We just don't have very much patience at all. And God wants us to learn to have patience. Be careful praying for them, though. Because the Bible teaches us that tribulation will bring about patience. And, and I don't know about you, but I've been tribulated enough in life. Amen? Amen. And so be careful when you pray for patience. But God wants us to have patience. And Abraham and Sarah did not have the patience that they should have possessed, my friend. So they didn't wait for that promised child. Abraham fathered a child with his wife's handmaid, Hagar. Now hatred began to separate Hagar and Sarah and Hagar ended up in a wilderness. Anybody ever been in a wilderness? I think we all have at one time or another. Now destitute and pregnant and all alone, she's visited by 
the angel of the Lord. Now, in Genesis chapter 16, verse number 10, listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says here, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, said unto Hagar, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, uh, that it shall be numbered for a multitude. And then in Genesis 16, verse 13, the Bible says, And she called the name of the Lord that had spake unto her. Now the Bible says in verse 10, And the angel of the Lord said unto her. But in verse 13, And she called the name of the Lord that spake to her, Thou God seest me, for she said, Have I also looked here uh, after him that seeth me? So Hagar is given hope here, even in the midst of a wilderness situation, by a visit from the angel of the Lord. Now, if we were to turn our Bibles over to Genesis chapter 21, verse 17, these are the words that we would read. The Bible says here, and God heard. Boy, I'm glad that God has a listening ear. The Bible says here that God heard the voice of, of the lad. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. You see, in this particular section of Scripture, the angel of the Lord and the word God are used interchangeably. So that gives us a beautiful picture of who the angel of the Lord really is. The angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. This is the Jesus Christ that walked before, before he was born as a baby in Bethlehem. It's no wonder that, that the angel of the Lord is the strongest and the most powerful of all the angels. It's no wonder that the angel of the Lord is the most knowledgeable angel that's ever lived. Now, the second thing that I want you to see is not only the angel of the Lord with, with uh, Hagar, but I want you to see the angel of the Lord with Abraham. Now, Abraham is about to sacrifice his son at the command of God. The Lord blessed me with two sons. And I love both my boys. I can't even begin to fathom what life would be like uh, if God were to speak to my heart and say to me, Danny, I want you to sacrifice your sons. This is a beautiful picture uh, uh, of the Son of God that would be sacrificed for the sins of the world. But Abraham has been asked to sacrifice his sons on Mount Moriah. And he's stopped by the angel of the Lord. Listen to what the Bible says in Genesis of, of chapter 22, verse 11 and verse number 12. The Bible says in Genesis of, here in chapter 22, verse 11, And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. Now, in good country talk, we'd be saying, I'm not here, Lord. Here am I. And he said, lay not, the angel of the Lord speaking now, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For I know now that thou fearest or have reverence for God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. So it's very obvious uh, from this particular statement in the Bible that the angel of the Lord is speaking here as God, as God himself. Notice the word me. Thou hast not withheld thine only son from me. In verse 11 it says, And the angel of the Lord called out unto him from heaven. And then the latter portion of verse 12 Thou hast not withheld thine only son from me. It's no wonder that the angel of the Lord is stronger than Michael. It's no wonder the angel of the Lord is so much more knowledgeable in his communication than Gabriel. Now the third thing that I want you to see in this is that the angel of the Lord also met with a man by the name of Jacob. 
about a man named Jacob, who later became uh, known as Israel. In Genesis chapter 31, Jacob begins to tell of a dream. He begins to share about a dream. And we see in this dream that once again, the angel of God, the angel of the Lord, is speaking. And Jacob begins by saying the angel of God spoke to him in a dream. Now, in the dream, the angel identifies himself. He says, I am the God of Bethel. I am the God of Bethel. In Genesis chapter 31, verse, verse number 13, the Bible says, I am the God of Bethel. This is the angel of God speaking. I am the God of Bethel, where thou anointest the pillar, and where thou vowest a vow unto me. Now arise and get thee out from this land and return unto the land of thy kindred. It's no wonder that the angel of the Lord is stronger than Michael. It's no wonder that the angel of the Lord is more knowledgeable than Gabriel. Why? Because the angel of the Lord is none other than the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. Probably one of my greatest uh, uh, thing or one of the greatest things that I want to bring to your attention in this particular message is his call of Moses. Man, I tell you what, I like his call of Moses. Now, when God set out to call Moses uh, to make sure that he would be able to have an experience, uh, uh, God gave Moses a calling that he would never forget. Now, you've got to remember who Moses was. Moses was in line to be the next Pharaoh of the most powerful nation on the face of the earth at that particular time. Moses was to be the next Pharaoh of Egypt. But Moses declined because he learned where he came from. He learned about his ancestor. And you'll remember the experience where some of the Egyptians was mistreating some of his people and he took care of that. He took care of that. And because of that he had to flee the land of Egypt and he, he fled the land of Egypt and he got to be a shepherd. You got to be a good shepherd before you know how to deal with people. I'm still learning. Amen. Amen. In Exodus, chapter number 3, verse 1 and 2, we get a beautiful picture of how God calls this great man of God to his service. Now listen to what the Bible says here. Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. The Bible says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert, and he came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Listen to what it says. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked. And behold, the bush burned with fire, but yet the bush was not consumed. Think about that now for just a moment. Now the Bible doesn't really tell us how the angel of the Lord really appeared to the others, to Jacob in a dream. Don't know how the angel of the Lord appeared to Hagar, but he did. Uh, Abraham heard a voice, but now here is the angel of the Lord appearing to Moses in a burning bush. Anybody ever burned a bush before? I started me a new burn pile at the house not long ago. Used to, I'd burn, not get a permit. I live way out in the country. 
I don't live that far out anymore, so I, I go online and get me a permit before I burn. And I pile up that little stuff in little piles and I burn it. I've yet to burn a pile that wasn't consumed. I've yet to do that. And if I ever do that, y'all visit me in the hospital, all right? If that ever happens to me, y'all come see me in the hospital. But here he is. He's out in the desert, and he notices a bush burning with fire. That got his attention. Probably, he said, somebody had been playing with matches. Don't even know that they had matches back then. <laughs> Somebody's been playing with fire. But then he notices there's something different about this fire. The bush is burning, but it's not burning. Did you catch that? The bush is burning, but it's not burning. How does a bush burn but not burn? Anything that burns usually burns up. But this bush is not burning up. And so Moses knew that he was dealing with something rather divine. And eager to see what it was, he inches closer to the bush that's burning but not being consumed. I got a feeling that I would have been turning around and going in a different direction. But there was something that was drawing Moses to the bush. Isn't that just like the Holy Spirit of God Amen. to draw us to Himself? You would have any been saved today if God hadn't drawn you to Himself. The gospel of Jesus Christ drawing you, the Holy Spirit drawing you to God. It's just like God. God's drawing Moses to the burning bush. And as he inches closer, he's a little bit afraid. And when he gets close enough, he hears a voice. Now I like to wait. That Hollywood does things every now and then. We got our own theories and ideas of what God's voice sounds like. Moses. Moses. Take off your shoes. Man, I'd have run. I can't help but believe that God's voice is a loving a voice of compassion and care. Moses, take off your shoes. For you're standing on holy ground. In verse number 6 of that particular chapter in Exodus, the Bible says, Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and the Bible says in Moses hid him, his, hid him fa his face, or he hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now, if you look back, it says Moses kept the flock, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire. But now in verse 6, it's, he, he's saying, listen to, to, to the flaming fire, I am the God of thy father. The angel of the Lord appeared in a flaming fire. I am the God of thy father. No wonder the angel of the Lord is more powerful than Michael. No wonder the angel of the Lord has more knowledge than Gabriel. And then the fifth thing that I want you to see is the angel of the Lord and the pre-incarnate Christ. Now we've looked at just a few. I think there's something like 30, at least 30 appearances of the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. We've looked at a few. 
But these few that we've looked at today consistently present a picture of an angel that is a cut above every angel that we've looked at thus far. Now, I believe in my heart that this angel of the Lord that I'm talking about is none other than the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know that some of you are probably asking, Preacher, how can this be? The appearances, if you study the New Testament, I mentioned to you that the angel of the Lord appeared over 30 times in the Old Testament. But if you begin to study the New Testament, you don't ever see the angel of the Lord anymore after the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see, Paul himself, he begins to, to point out that Jesus is the angel of the Lord in his letter to the church of Corinth. Now, finally, Jesus acknowledged his own presence in the world before he came to Bethlehem. If I turn your Bibles, I want you to look at this scripture. Turn your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter number 24. Luke's Gospel, chapter number 24. I want us to look at verse number 27 when I get there. I'm about to read John. <laughs> Luke's Gospel, chapter 24. Look at verse 27. This is what Jesus said. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all in the scriptures the things concerning himself. You see that? That's what Jesus said of himself. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So I believe with all of my heart that this angel of the Lord that's mentioned throughout the Old Testament is a pre-incarnate figure of the Lord Jesus Christ who appeared to so many. He appeared at Sodom and Gomorrah. He appeared in other places. And he shows the power of God and he speaks as God as he's speaking to those that he appeared to. How do you make excuses to the angel of the Lord when he appears to you in a burning bush? But Moses did. And how many times do you and I make excuses? We don't even have to deal with the angel of the Lord anymore because Jesus is not pre-incarnate anymore. He has he's come to die on the cross and he died. He died. And he resurrected. And he ascended back to heaven. And he's sitting at the right hand of God making intercession for you and I. But here's Moses making excuses to the angel of the Lord in a bush that's burning but not burning. I just want to say this. I'm glad God's God. Because there's some times that if I was God, when Moses started to make excuses, I might have caused that fire to jump out at him a little bit. But you see, God's God. And God loved him in spite of his making excuses. And God loves us in spite of ourselves. One of the biggest excuses I've heard since being a preacher of the gospel, especially from those who are lost and without God, is preacher, I'll get saved when I can get a little bit better. You know what I usually tell people that tell me that? You won't ever make it. Because you can't get better. And the best you can be, the Bible says, is as a filthy rag in the sight of God. 
But when God draws you, and you yield to the Holy Spirit of God that's drawing you, and you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you notice I said as your Lord and Savior, when you make him Lord of all, it's then that you begin not to make an excuse like you once made an excuse. Because it's then that you're created in his very image, in his likeness. Ephesians 2.10 says it this way, For you are his workmanship created unto good works. Works don't save you, but they follow your salvation. A fellow sent me a picture this week of a roaring lion. And on that side of the picture it said Christianity before America. And then on the other side of that was the lion from the Wizard of Oz. And the top of that said Americanized Christianity. What does that mean, preacher? We make excuses like the cowardly lion as to why we can't do. Moses made excuses but the angel of the Lord spoke from the burning bush and gave him every reason as to why he could do. And then even called his brother to help him do. And that's the kind of God that we serve. A God who, who wants us to to be willing to, to be used by Him. Today, you and I are blessed to be the recipients of, of two great revelations, the Scripture and the incarnate Son of the living God. Somebody said to me one time, says, Preacher, if I could just hear His voice. Here's His voice. Amen. He's given you His voice. Every word written on the pages of this book is the voice of God. Now I want to tell you something. There's a few mistakes in this book. Don't look at me spiritual like you don't believe me. Oh, bless God, preacher. I believe that Bible from cover to cover. Don't you tell me there's some mistakes in it. Well, they are. The mistakes that men made that God allowed other men to print about so we wouldn't make the same mistakes. That's the mistakes you'll find in this book. The Bible tells us about David's adultery. That was a mistake. But God loved him in spite of his adultery. The Bible tells us about Abraham and Sarah running that woman off and sending her out into the wilderness. That was a mistake. God allowed it to be printed so we don't make the same mistake. Listen, this is God's Word. It's God's voice to you. And the sad thing is, very few people ever read it. Amen. I got just a little bit of my pastor in me, and I can't help it because he taught me well. Martin and I was riding the other day, and there was a car in front of us. And I said, baby, would you look in the back wing? Would you look in the back glass of that car? I said, tell me what you see. She said, I see a Bible. I said, looks like it's been there a while, don't it? Why did it look like it had been there a while, honey? The leather cover was flipped, curled by the sun. Now, we don't do it anymore, but used to in Sunday school, there was a question that was already always asked. How many of you read your Bibles every day this week? Is it still on the little? Well, then that, that's old literature there. <laughs> you won't find them on the new ones, I don't think. But I mean, I, you may. But listen, how many of you read your Bible every week? Brother John Gibbs used to walk down the streets of Tiffin. He'd walk down the sidewalks. He'd say, that's a Baptist car, that's a Baptist car, that's a Baptist car. And I looked at him one day and I said, Brother John, how do you know it's Baptist cars? He said, because the Sunday school quarterly stuck in the Bible and it's laying on the dash and that's where it'll stay till next Sunday. And then everybody will lie and say they read their lesson and read their Bible every day. Man, you can lie to your preacher. 
You've lied to the deacons. You've lied to the Sunday school teachers. But you can't lie to God. If you want to hear from God, you've got the Word of God. But listen, not only do we have the Word of God, we've got the incarnate Son of the living God. In the Old Testament Scriptures, they were incomplete. And Jesus had not come as of yet. So he appeared as the angel of the Lord. And in the loving nature of God, he penetrated the darkness of those Old Testament days occasionally with revelations of himself through the angel of the Lord. And today, we don't need those appearances anymore. Because we have the crucified, resurrected, living Lamb of God sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. Now let me ask you something as we bring this thing to a close. Do you know Him? Do you know Him? Last week we had Brother Eddie Middleton. A lot of people didn't understand why Brother Eddie wanted everybody to fill out that little piece of paper that he had me to make copies of and hand out. Had several people ask me, why we got to do this? And I said, well, it's just your testimony. Listen, you either got a testimony or a test of baloney. And I mean, that's, that's all he wanted was for you to write your testimony. You see, I've got all of those. I haven't, haven't been able to go through all of them yet, but i got all of them on my desk at home. And I'm going to fix from those whenever I get a little bit more time what's called a book of remembrance to have here at the church. Now, one of the things that really shocked me in some of the ones that I've looked at so far was how we didn't mention the name of Jesus. That concerns me just a little bit. When I preach that Jesus is God, well, that may be true. But there's only one way to the Father of God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh to the Father but by me. Trusting God and living good. I don't care how good you live and how much you trust God. If you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're not going to heaven. You've got to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. He's the only way to the Father. The only way. The only way. Now, in our modern culture, we're trying to make many ways. And the sad thing is there are going to be a lot of people wake up in hell thinking that they had their ticket punched by going some other way. I'm going to say this and we'll close. You've heard it before, but it would be a good place to put it in here again because we forget, don't we? There are prominent Baptists that I know in Tifton, Georgia had some different people different kind of people that started coming to their church. and He looked at me one day and he shared this with me. Uh, I was doing a little bit of business with him in Tifton. And he said, Brother Daddy, said, we've got uh, some different people coming to our church now that believe a little bit different than we do. He said, you know, I, he said, they kind of persuaded me. He said, I, said, I kind of believe there's more than one way to heaven, don't you? Boy, he made a mistake when he said that. I mean, he was all right whenever he made the first statement. You know, I kind of believe there's another way to heaven, don't you? I kind of believe there's another way to heaven. If he'd have stopped right there, I, 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 I probably would. I'd, I'd probably just, you know, I'd probably said something to him, but it wouldn't be near as strong. But you see, this is what he said. I believe there's more than one way to heaven, don't you? Oh, he shouldn't have said that. I looked at him and I said, no, I don't. I said, because Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. He's your ticket to heaven. And if you don't know him today, 
Friend, you're lost. Amen. And it'd be a good day to get saved. It'd be a good day to get saved because God loves you. And your preacher loves you. And I certainly don't want to see any of you go to hell. Amen. Don't want to see anybody go to hell. But I want to see everybody get to make it to heaven. That's why Eddie's got such an evangelical heart. He wants to see people go to heaven. You ever been mad with somebody or saw somebody that was mad with somebody and said, oh, you go to hell? You ever heard anybody say that? That's completely misusing the term and taking it out of context. But I never, I don't want to tell nobody to go to that awful place. If I get upset with somebody, I say, bless God, you go to heaven. <laughs> I want everybody to go to heaven, make heaven their home. Amen? I do. But the only way to do that is through Jesus Christ. And if you're here today and you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, it'd be a good time to do that today because he loves you. I love you. Those that are saved in this building love you. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. Stand with me. Father, thank you so much. And now I pray that you'll use this for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.